Bonjour tout le monde. Our government spent eight out of every ten dollars deployed in Canada to keep Canadians safe and solvent during the COVID pandemic. And our economic plan to get through that pandemic worked. Canada's economy has now recovered 112% of the jobs that were lost during the first months of the COVID pandemic. Our unemployment rate is down to just 5.5%. And our real GDP is more than a full percentage point above where it was before COVID hit us. Canada really has come roaring back. But Canadians know that fighting COVID and the COVID recession came at a price. And they know that inflation, a global phenomenon, is making things more expensive here in Canada too. Our government understands that our ability to spend is not infinite. And we know that the time for extraordinary COVID support is over. And we are committed to reviewing and reducing government spending because that is the responsible thing to do. Canada is absolutely determined that our debt to GDP ratio must continue to decline. The pandemic debt that we incurred to keep Canadians safe and solvent must be paid down and it is being paid down. Our deficits must continue to decline. That is our fiscal anchor. This is a line we will not cross. And this is what will ensure that Canada's finances remain sustainable. La première chose dont je veux parler est le logement. Le logement est un besoin humain fondamental et un impératif économique. Une main d'œuvre en croissance a besoin de plus de logements pour vivre. Au cours des dix prochaines années, nous doublerons le nombre de logements que nous construirons au Canada. Nous rendrons le marché plus équitable pour les Canadiens et Canadiennes, notamment en interdisant la chatte de propriété par des intérêts étrangers. Notre plan de logement rendra la vie plus abordable et il sera également bénéfique pour notre économie. We will also invest in our workers by making it easier for workers to go where the jobs are and by helping them make sure they have the skills our economy needs right now. We will make it easier for immigrants to make Canada their home and, once they get here, to do the jobs they are trained for. And we will continue to invest in early learning and childcare, Canada's most significant driver of economic growth since the NAFTA trade agreement. This budget invests heavily in economic growth in making our economy more productive and more innovative, in expanding Canada's economic capacity over the long term. It includes a new Canada Growth Fund, which will attract significant private capital to support Canadian industries in the green transition. It will include a new innovation and investment agency, which will help businesses across our economy become more productive and more innovative. And we are launching a critical minerals and metals plan that will create thousands of good jobs and help provide Canada and our allies with the critical minerals and metals our economies need. En nous appuyant sur notre plan de réduction des émissions, nous investirons dans la transition verte. Cette transition a le potentiel d'être à la fois bonne pour la planète et pour l'économie canadienne. L'économie mondiale se dirige vers un bilan carbonétre et le Canada ne peut pas traîner de la pâte. Ce budget 
est axé sur la croissance économique pour aujourd'hui, pour demain et pour les décennies à venir. C'était notre objet principal et il contribuera à créer des emplois, à rendre la vie plus abordable et à bâtir un Canada où personne n'est lassé par compte, pour compte. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention et je suis prête maintenant à répondre à vos questions. Uh, 25 minutes of questions, please. One question, one follow-up. And I just ask that you please state your name and your outlet before asking the question. Just quickly. Nous allons maintenant prendre les questions de média pendant 25 minutes. Une question et une question de suivi. S'il vous plaît, uh, donnez votre nom et votre média avant de poser votre question. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Freeland, David Aiken, Global News. Good to be in a lockup uh, in person again after pandemics. Uh, just to talk about housing. All the initiatives on improving things for first time home buyers, uh, there's several of them, increasing uh, tax credits, all inflationary. And so the paradox is as you make it easier for home buyers to buy their first home, then that is going to put pressure on demand and uh, that is going to put, that is going to make houses more expensive. Is it really the right time to be giving people money, essentially, to buy homes? Um, so, actually, David, in putting together this budget, we were very mindful of elevated inflationary pressures, really, really thoughtful about it. And so the first point I'd like to make is this is a budget which focuses on expanding the supply side of the economy. Inflation happens when you have demand chasing supply, which is not available. We get that. And so there are, is measure after measure about increasing supply, whether it is labor supply, supply of workers, or to come to your housing question, housing supply. And in fact, the housing plan is very intentionally, overwhelmingly focused on supply side measures. 90% of the investment in housing is about driving and increasing housing supply. We recognize that the central challenge in Canada when it comes to housing is a lack of supply. And this budget is about tackling that head on. We recognize the federal government does not have all the tools to increase housing supply. So we've tried to be really creative and put forward ways that the federal government can work with municipalities, provinces and territories to drive housing supply. And so that's why sort of the landmark commitment, the landmark ambition in this budget is to double over the next 10 years the number of new homes that are being built every year. Excellent. Thank you. And let's talk about supply. That would essentially create, what, five years, about uh, 800,000 homes if, if, in fact, you hit those targets. CMHC has said the gap is we, we need a million and a half. So there's still going to be a very significant gap in terms of supply. Um, is there not more that could have been done to address supply of homes given that, again, the CMHC has identified that if you do everything you say you'll do and it works perfectly, you won't even be halfway there. We are going to do everything we say we're going to do and I would point to our delivery on early learning and child care as a proof point of our commitment to deliver on the things we've laid out. In terms of housing, I do think it's important to be candid and open. Uh, that there is no one silver bullet. There is no single policy in a single budget that will mean that as of tomorrow or as of next week, every single person in Canada can afford to own a home in the neighborhood where they want to live. That is not possible, and I recognize that. But what we can do is clearly identify the challenge and the core challenge is housing supply, put forward real and specific policies designed to build and increase housing supply, which we do in this budget, and put money on the table. 
And what I say in the budget, uh, and what I absolutely believe, is this is the most ambitious housing plan to tackle supply any Canadian government has ever put forward. And it's also just a first step. A growing country, and that's what Canada very much is, is going to need to continue to invest in housing supply year after year after year. We have the fastest growing population in the G7. As finance minister, I see that as a huge competitive advantage. You know, the whole world right now is struggling with labor shortages. We are too, but we're struggling less and we have an answer, which is a growing population. A growing population needs a growing housing supply. This budget invests meaningfully in that, lays out a plan to build housing supply, and it's only the first step. We're going to have to keep on investing more and more year after year. Thanks, David. Next question. Bonjour, Madame Freeland, Raymond Fillion de TVA. Vous avez beaucoup d'argent que vous ne dépensez pas. Vous vous attaquez, vous l'avez dit en anglais tout à l'heure, au déficit. Vous auriez pu en dépenser beaucoup plus que vous n'en dépensez. Pourquoi cette retenue à ce moment-ci, entre autres au niveau des dépenses militaires? Ce que vous annoncez aujourd'hui, le militaire, ça va amener le Canada à 1,5 de son PIB. Qu'est-ce que vous dites aux pays alliés du Canada? Merci pour la question. J'apprécie la question énormément parce que ça me dit que vous avez compris ce qu'on a fait avec ce budget et notre stratégie. Euh, on a vraiment pris une approche responsable en ce qui concerne la fiscalité. Je comprends que pour le Canada, notre tradition, notre histoire, de prendre une approche responsable fiscale est un très grand avantage. Et le fait qu'avant de la crise de COVID, on a pris une approche responsable en ce qui concerne la fiscalité nous a aidé beaucoup. Maintenant, la crise de COVID n'est pas avec nous. La crise économique de COVID est passée et c'est vraiment le moment pour une approche responsable. Et cette approche responsable est importante aujourd'hui, plus que jamais, à cause de l'incertitude économique au niveau mondial et à cause de le niveau d'inflation élevé. Alors oui, on a pris une approche responsable fiscale et c'est la bonne chose à faire. Euh, concernant Uh, les dépenses uh, pour uh, la défense du Canada. On a, dans ce budget, dépensé beaucoup pour la défense. On a des dépenses plus élevées qu'en avant. Et pour dire la vérité, on dépense plus pour la défense que était planifié avant de l'invasion de l'Ukraine par la Russie. La situation dans le monde a changé et c'est nécessaire, je suis d'accord, de dépenser de plus. Mais c'est important de faire des dépenses dans une manière planifiée et dans une manière efficace. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle, oui, on a dépensé du plus pour aujourd'hui. Et on a dit qu'on aura euh, une étude très vite de nos dépenses militaires, euh, de ce, du, des besoins du Canada aujourd'hui dans une situation qui a changé beaucoup. Une étude qui doit se focuser sur l'efficacité des dépenses et sur... Euh, notre, de créer une plan qu'on peut vraiment mettre en œuvre. La dernière chose que je vais dire en ce qui concerne les dépenses militaires, c'est que c'est évident que le plus grave, grave danger aujourd'hui 
dans le monde, c'est la menace de Poutine. Et en Boucha, on a vu que c'est un régime qui est vraiment criminel. C'est un régime qui n'a aucune limite. Et c'est vraiment une menace pour toutes les démocraties du monde. Au Canada, nous sommes chanceux parce que ce sont les Ukrainiens qui font la guerre pour la démocratie et pour nous. Mais nous pouvons aider les Ukrainiens parce que vraiment vaincre cette guerre contre Poutine est très important et avantageuse pour nous. Et pour cette raison, dans le budget, on a 500 millions de dollars pour euh, acheter euh, des armes duquel les Ukrainiens ont besoin. Et c'est vraiment une dépense qui est ciblée au le plus grand danger auquel le Canada fait face aujourd'hui. Électoral, votre parti avait dit qu'il avait l'intention d'aller chercher 10 milliards de dollars dans les coffres des banques, des compagnies d'assurance. Aujourd'hui, dans votre budget, vous parlez de seulement 6 milliards. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé? Pourquoi vous n'allez pas chercher le 10 milliards annoncé? Et aussi, pourquoi ne, ne pas avoir annoncé dans le budget des montants pour les transferts en santé que réclament les provinces? C'est deux questions, Raymond. Euh, mais concernant les taxes, euh, je pense qu'on a un plan responsable et nécessaire dans ce budget en ce qui concerne les revenus. C'était important pour nous de mettre en œuvre les cibles du campagne électorale, de les mettre en œuvre dans une manière intelligente du côté économique, dans une manière qui ressemble ce euh, qui fait nos partenaires, nos concurrents au niveau international. Et c'est ce qu'on a fait en ce qui concerne les taxes. Mais le total du revenu euh, qu'on va gagner avec les mesures dans ce budget est plus élevé de ce qu'on a ciblé pendant la campagne électorale. Merci. Prochaine question. Good afternoon. Marika Walsh with The Globe and Mail. Minister, you're calling this a growth budget, but economists we're speaking to say that none of the measures in the budget are leading them to revise their projections for Canada up. And the two things you're pointing to, the Innovation Agency and the new growth fund, seem to be creating new bureaucracies when past attempts, like the Infrastructure Bank, and the superclusters were not as successful as the government hoped. So why are you turning to these two new agencies, and how will you ensure that they are actually able to deliver on what you're saying they'll do? Okay, so when it comes to growth projections, I don't expect anyone to transform their projections two minutes after reading a budget. What I expect us to do is to enact the plans that we've laid out in the budget and with those plans to actually increase the growth numbers that Canada posts. And I'll return to the example of early learning and childcare. It is a truth universally acknowledged that early learning and childcare does increase economic growth. That is something which many studies have shown, which the example of Quebec has shown, and which Bay Street economists were writing about ahead of last year's budget. It didn't automatically translate into people bumping up their growth projections for Canada. But what we did is we knew it was the right thing for Canada. We laid out a plan last year, and we have now implemented that plan. And we're going to do the same thing with the growth plan in this year's budget. I really want to emphasize for people that this is a three-part growth plan. It's a suite of 
investments in people that will drive growth with housing as the centerpiece of that investment. It is investments in the green transition, which we all know is essential and is really, really expensive. And the policies here will help Canada make that major, major shift, the biggest shift, I think, for the Canadian economy since the Industrial Revolution. And the third element is an investment in productivity. And look, you guys are all Canadian political and economic journalists. You know that for the past 30 years, at least, when economists look at the Canadian economy, they have said productivity is a challenge and we need to somehow move the dial. And we've put forward some specific measures that will do that. And I can talk more about the Canada Growth Fund and the Innovation Agency, but maybe I've answered that question for long enough and I'll save that for others if they're interested. Okay, and I have to turn to another topic, but it is a bit related. On innovation, your government promised a DARPA-style pro a program in the election. Um, then during our technical briefing, a senior official seemed to say it didn't work or it doesn't work. And so do you agree that that model is not right for Canada? And, and why did it go from being the right thing during the election and now not? During the election, we identified something which frankly was and is a truth universally acknowledged, that we need to do more to drive per capita GDP growth in Canada, that we need to increase our productivity, that we need to get businesses to invest more in productivity. That's what we understood during the campaign. We put forward a suite of measures. One of them was an agency, which we called in shorthand CARPA, to drive innovation. In this budget, what we're doing is going from that high-level commitment to saying, we've been working on this, we've been looking at this, we've been looking at where really is the innovation challenge in Canada? And the innovation agency that we outline in this budget is the answer. The thing about Canada is we're actually really good at excellent abstract theoretical research. Our scientists win Nobel Prizes. We have really, really cutting edge thinking being done here. Where the gap is in Canada is translating invention into innovation, is in helping businesses to take those great ideas from the lab, um, you know, from the math, whiteboard uh, and translating it into making your business do more with the resources you have, making your business grow. And that's what this innovation agency is going to be targeted at. And I would urge people, you know, look at the work of Dan Bresnitz, who is a leading thinker on innovation, who's been working at finance uh, for a few months, helping our thinking on this. Look at what Israel has done. Look at what Finland has done. We've been talking to the people in those countries who built those countries' innovation efforts, innovation agencies who really managed to have that step change in how their economies worked. There is more work to do on the innovation agency, but we're committed to it. And, you know, we, we understand that this is a challenge that has been around for a long time and that our government is committed to getting better at. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, uh, good morning, Mr. Ryan Templeton, National Post. You're talking about growth here and productivity, and you talk about how long they've been a challenge, uh, but they haven't been a major focus of liberal budgets since this government was elected in 2015. Why now? Why are you making the switch to focus on this issue now? Because we really need it. Uh, I think Canadians understand that post-COVID, our country needs a growth strategy. We need to pay down our COVID debts. And in a very uncertain 21st century, Canada really needs an economic plan that is going to allow us to increase our productivity, to increase our economic growth. And I realize, you know, talking about productivity, 
is not something a smart politician does because the eyes glaze over when you say, hey, you know, we're a great government, we're going to increase productivity. And so, you know, I'd like to sort of translate that into why it's important for our government and it's important for every Canadian. Increasing Canada's productivity, increasing Canada's per capita GDP growth is about what I think is one of the most fundamental aspirations of every Canadian which is that our children will have better, more prosperous lives than we do. And that has been the experience of all previous generations of Canadians. It's really important that that be our experience today. It's really important that young Canadians graduating into the job market are graduating into an economy that is strongly growing. And so that's why this is the time for a strong push on economic growth. There are many um, platform commitments uh, from last fall that are not in this budget. Obviously, you have more to go, but there are new commitments from the deal that you have made with the NDP. Did you have to push out liberal platform commitments in order to accommodate the deal with the NDP? No. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Uh, hi, Minister. Dylan Robertson from the Winnipeg Free Press. Uh, your housing pledges for Indigenous communities, it's about one-tenth of the requests from the Assembly of First Nations and your government's own panel on urban Indigenous housing. The mandate letters promised a construction boom this summer. The amount allocated over five years is multiples lower than what's needed. It seems Indigenous people are barely mentioned in your opening remarks in the budget. Why is Indigenous housing such a low priority for your government? I totally disagree with the premise of the question. Uh, in this budget, the very highest spending area is the green transition. I think no one can disagree with that. The second highest area of spending is reconciliation. Over the fiscal framework, second highest reconciliation. So if you judge a government's priorities by where the money is going, that is a meaningful commitment. And likewise on Indigenous housing, $4 billion for Indigenous housing, really, really meaningful commitment in and of itself, and a commitment which stacks up very, very well against the overall housing commitment. Your government's election platform promised $6 billion in new funding for backlogs. There's only $2 billion allocated over the next five years. Why are you reducing that platform promise by two-thirds, and why is there still no timeline for starting negotiations on the health care transfer? So again, on health, very meaningful commitments. The $2 billion that we have already committed on support with backlogs is real money going exactly where we need it. In terms of health overall, this is something that we need to work hard together with the provinces and territories to get right. And it's a complicated challenge. It's complicated because we need to reach agreement with lots of different parties, with lots of different approaches, with lots of different interests. And that takes time, and that takes lots of good conversations. Those conversations have started, but we need to do it right. And the second reason that the health care challenge is complicated is we know in Canada that health care is something definitely worth investing in. I think that is sort of one of the core, widely shared national convictions we have. And I'm really glad that this budget includes a long overdue expansion of that commitment to dental care. I think we also know, as Canadians, that actually, on a per capita basis, relative to our peers in industrial countries, Canada's biggest challenge isn't that we don't spend enough on health care. We actually spend quite a bit compared to peer countries. And we spend quite a bit on health care compared 
to peer countries who get better outcomes than we do. And so even as I think all Canadians agree, healthcare needs to be a priority and we really need to do better and better. I think all Canadians would also agree, let's do it in a smart way. That's what we're going to do. with Bloomberg News. I just want to build on that a little bit because there's a fair amount in that platform from last fall in the healthcare sector that's not in the budget. There's the Canada Mental Health tr uh, Transfer that was $4.5 billion. There's a bunch of uh, billions more really in, in for family doctors and other things uh, that, that as far as I could tell are not in this fiscal framework. So have you, and, and Pharmacare of course is not in the fiscal framework yet either. Have you decided you can't afford to do some of these things right now or is that money still coming in future budgets? We were elect we had an election last fall, and this is therefore the first of four budgets. You are not going to see every single thing we have an ambition to do in the first budget. So we are building, and this is the first of four chapters. So yes, we will do more things over the next three budgets. We will, however, do those additional things, fulfill those further promises within an absolutely responsible fiscal framework. So going back to a brief answer you gave earlier then, it does seem that your deal with the NDP, pu pushing off the prospect of an election next year or the year after, does it fair to say that gives you more runway to roll these things out? It, you don't have to do everything as quickly. We were always building this budget on the assumption we had a four-year mandate. And we have time for one more question. Il nous reste assez de temps pour une dernière question. Boris Proud du Devoir, euh, vous, euh, sur les soins dentaires, le programme de soins dentaires, vous avez de l'argent pour cette année. Euh, J'aimerais savoir, est-ce que ça va prendre la forme d'un crédit d'impôt remboursable ou sinon, euh, quelle forme il pourrait prendre dans une province comme le Québec? OK, c'est une bonne question. Um, et en ce qui concerne les soins, les soins dentaires, on a de l'argent pour cette année, mais pour toutes les prochaines années, dans, euh, duquel on, sur lesquelles on fait un plan dans ce budget. Alors, ce n'est pas, je, je veux euh, être très clair que ce n'est pas l'argent seulement pour cette année. Uh, concernant comment on va mettre en œuvre uh, ce plan, j'ai discuté ça uh, hier et aussi la semaine passée avec notre formidable ministre de la Santé, Jean-Yves Duclos. Uh, il a déjà commencé son travail. Uh, C'est compliqué, uh, comme uh, tous uh, qui concernent uh, la santé. Uh, comme tous les enjeux qui concernent le fédéral et les provinces et territoires. Uh, mais on a déjà commencé le travail. Ça répond moyennement à ma question, mais je vais enchaîner pour la santé publique fédérale. a uh, dit qu'il existe un scénario comme quoi la COVID pourrait revenir sous une autre forme, moins probable, d'accord, mais qui nécessiterait de nouveaux confinements. Qu'est-ce qui se passe maintenant qu'on n'a plus cette police d'assurance? En ce qui concerne la COVID, on est au niveau fédéral, on est très bien préparé. On a eu un programme très fort d'approvisionnement et on a des médecins, on a des vaccins duquel on a besoin. Et c'est important que les Canadiens euh, doivent avoir la confiance à euh, que on est préparé. En ce qui concerne toutes les incertitudes euh, devant lesquelles le Canada fait face, je veux aussi assurer les Canadiens et Canadiennes que c'est une approche fiscale économique responsable. Et 
une des raisons pour lesquelles c'était important pour nous maintenant de prendre une approche responsable, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup, beaucoup d'incertitudes euh, dans l'économie mondiale. Il y a d'incertitudes en ce qui concerne le Covid dans la Chine. Il y a la guerre en Ukraine euh, et tous les effets économiques que cette guerre peut avoir. Alors, on ne peut pas prévoir vraiment aujourd'hui quels seront les dangers dans les prochains six mois. Mais ce qu'on peut faire est de mettre le Canada dans une position économique et fiscale qui nous permettra de répondre à tous les possibles menaces. Et c'est ce qu'on a essayé de faire. Et merci beaucoup. Uh, ceci conclut la conférence de presse. La vice-première ministre va aller au champ. This concludes today's press conference as we need to go to the house now. Thank you. Merci. Okay. Merci beaucoup.